So welcome everyone. Thank you very much for coming to the Tuliomi Nature and You lecture series for, for April. I'm going to start just um, saying a little bit about Tuliomi. I, I hope all of you know all about Tuliomi, but um, we are a small nonprofit. We're based in Woodland and we're a conservation nonprofit that focuses primarily on the Northern Inner Coast Range, which is the Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument area. It's in uh, on the west side of the Sacramento Valley, near the mountains there. So it's Lake County, Napa County, Yellow County, Mendocino County area up there. In addition to this lecture series, we offer things like uh, California Certified California Naturalist class. We've actually got a accelerated class coming up in a couple of weeks up at Wilbur Hot Springs, which is in uh, Calusa County, just north of Yellow County. Um, we do a lot of other events, both virtual and in person now. So we've had virtual wildflower tours and we have some in-person wildflower tours this time of year. Uh, we, we sponsor hikes and trail building and maintenance. One of our big projects right now is the Woodland Regional Park, which is a old landfill that's just outside of Woodland, and we're helping to convert that into a public park. So we're doing plantings and, and um, some, some development out there to turn that into a, a public area. I'm going to have you guys stay on mute, and then if you have questions at any time, you can type them into chat. and. If it's something that I think is important to interrupt Jonathan, I will interrupt him. Otherwise, we'll save the questions for the end. And um, after his talk, we will go through all those questions. <clears throat> With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. We have Jonathan Young. He is a wildlife ecologist. And um, a little bit of his background, he got a degree in biology from San Diego State University and moved to San Francisco and began, began a long-term relationship with the Presidio, which is an area, um, just one corner of the city of San Francisco, I'm sure he'll describe the Presidio. Uh, he started out as a volunteer and he worked his way through several different internships and completed his master's degree in San, at San Francisco State University studying urban amphibian conservation and disease ecology. At that point, he was hired by the Presidio Trust as the first dedicated staff member with a sole focus on wildlife. Since then, he's been developing the Presidio Wildlife Program, <laughs> which includes surveying, monitoring, managing, and restoring the diversity of animals in the, found in the park. Uh, one thing I was going to mention is that we like to focus, here at Tuliomi, we like to focus on, on the, the Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument, which is kind of a wild area up there. But we don't, we don't really live there. We like to visit there. We like to protect there. We like to conserve that area. We live in an urban environment. Just about everybody on this call, I suspect, is living in an urban environment. And nature does not only live in the wilderness. It lives in an urban environment as well. So that is what uh, we're going to be hearing about from Jonathan today. So thank you very much and welcome, Jonathan. Take it away. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here. Good to be given this opportunity, although not as fun as in real life, human to human. I can't see your faces, but I'll imagine all of them. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Like that. There we go. It's good to go. You seeing that, Bill? Yep, it looks good. All right. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the bigger concept of urban nature and using the Presidio, what we're doing here in San Francisco, which is just at the very tip of the peninsula. It's part of the National Golden Gate National Recreation Area, which spans uh, three different counties. The Presidio is kind of the hub of the uh, Golden Gate National Recreation Area. And I'm going to be talking about restoring na urban nature, but through the perspective, through the lens of wildlife, which is really my area of expertise. Uh, before I get into the meat of all of this, I wanna do a little bit of a, a silent visual 
uh, kind of an exploration. So I'm not going to say anything over these next couple of slides. So it's going to be silent. I just want you to see the, the imagery and just kind of let, let it flow over you. And then we'll, and then we'll talk about it. So here we go. serenity now. So most all of us, as Bill just said, are all living in urban areas. Um, and some of us, it sounds like, at least a good amount of us, uh, we're here because we have a connection to nature. And we're fortunate enough, at least I'm assuming most of us, if not all of us, have the ability to escape these urban areas and get away to these wild spaces. Um, this is an image of urban areas around the world from 1950. The size and the color of the circle represent population density and city urban development. 1950, 2020. So you can see a huge drastic increase in, in urbanization of pop the human population. This is just another representation of that. You can see around 2007, we surpassed the 50% mark of uh, human beings living in urban areas. So we're seeing less people living in rural natural areas moving into the urban areas. And that's where really the human population density are starting to really grow in these urban concrete jungles. And again, very few of us have the ability and the means to get out to these grand open spaces, these uh, air quotes, pristine spaces. And we are uh, more exposed to urban nature. And when people think of urban nature, they automatically think of vacant lots like this, um, unused, unkept, unsafe, unclean situations like this. Uh, of course, children um, are having less opportunities. These urban kids are having less opportunities to get out and explore. And more and more we're seeing uh, screen time, less outdoor activity, more screen time, and which has uh, been labeled by the scientists as nature deficit disorder. And it's been showing more and more to have an impact on long-term development of children um, who either have access to nature or do not have access to nature. Of course, we've been hearing more and more that uh, science is showing nature and its health to um, our both mental and physical well-being. And uh, nature provides, as we all are familiar with, what we would term ecosystem services. So we can all understand the value of clean air and clean water and healthy, a healthy functioning ecosystem is going to result in these ecosystem services is clean water and clean air. So I'm gonna talk about these kinds of concepts with the, um, within San Francisco's Presidio and what we're doing and how we're, we're trying to uh, improve these, these various concepts of human health and access to nature. So zooming into San Francisco, just to put a little bit of context around what we all know and love of current day San Francisco, as we see here in the background. Um, of course, San Francisco obviously was not always a city and we all know, or at least some of us might know that famously San Francisco was once majority dunescape. So I'm just gonna kind of give you a visual representation of what it once looked like before it was what it is today. Looking south down Ocean Beach, the Cliff House, the Dunes, Richmond District. That's Lake Merced right there, San Francisco State University is in, around that area now. This would have been uh, common throughout the Sunset District and the Richmond District, these backwater dune swales, excellent habitat for frog breeding, for example. This is the Coal Valley area near the Haight-Ashbury, if you're familiar. Once there was a lake up near Haight-Ashbury, no longer. This is Mountain Lake in the Presidio. We're going to be talking a little bit more about that. This is an overlay from the 1930s over the Sunset District today. You can see the really the last bit of what they used to call the Great Sand Waste. And this is the earliest image that we have of the Golden Gate. That's the Presidio main post right there, 1816. Um, and that's the Golden Gate and the Marin Headlands out there in the, back, in the background. And this, of course, is what it looks like today with the Golden Gate right there. You can see the Presidio in the background. And of course, 
what we all know of as San Francisco, the urban jungle. With all this um, loss of habitat, we lost a lot of associated wildlife. And we are actually famous in the world of Lepidoptera, uh, Lepidopterists, those that study moths and butterflies, for being the first known case of a butterfly going extinct due to human development. What you see here is the Xerxes blue butterfly. It only flew in San Francisco's dunes. It was a dune obligate species. And when the majority of the dunes were bulldozed over, we lost the habitat and therefore we lost the species off the face of the earth. Xerxes blue no longer flies anywhere in the world. 1943 is when it was last seen. And of course the state and city bird, the California quail, once common and abundant in San Francisco County, no longer occurs in the county of San Francisco. It is gone. The last bird was actually one sad little individual living in Golden Gate Park. It was last seen about two years ago, but it was just the one individual for many, many years. The last quail in the Presidio was 2005. So they've been gone for a couple decades. So zooming in now to the Presidio, this is uh, really what we're gonna focus on right now. And those of you who have visited it, you um, might not know, but it is a national park. And those of you who have ever driven north or south of the Golden Gate Bridge, you have driven through the Presidio. And you, again, may or may not know that this is a national park. It is not a city park and it has a lot of history. So I wanna talk a little bit about the history to put some of the context around what I wanna talk about in terms of restoration. So this is uh, looking out down again at the Golden Gate, the main post right there. And just look at the landscape, no trees. You can see little patches of trees coming up. Those were planted by the military. Those were not there naturally. And of course, in the mid 1990s, the United States military pulled out of many um, military bases that were deemed no longer strategically important, including the Presidio. And it was noted for having such high historical cultural value and natural resources that instead of selling it off to the highest bidder, they decided, Congress decided to lump it in to the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. And of course, when the Presidio was handed over, the military literally just pulled out and left, leaving all of their garbage and a whole mess of, uh, for the Presidio to deal with. And just to step back a bit, the National Park Service originally inherited the Presidio, but it wasn't uh, the Presidio Trust was created as a federal agency to manage and maintain the Presidio, the majority of the Presidio. So I work for the federal agency that's called the Presidio Trust. So the Presidio Trust inherited this mess from the United States military, which also included unexploded ordinances. We are still finding these in the field today. And uh, a variety of old, uh, ranging in, in dilapidation, old buildings from as early as the 1770s upwards to the 1980s. So a lot of uh, historical features and the military, they really did a number on the landscape, but it's actually a double-edged sword because the presence of the military starting in 1776 up until the 1990s actually prevented the complete loss of the Presidio and these landscapes that you see here, which are the remnant landscapes of San Francisco for tens of thousands of years. Had the military not been here, all of this would have been bulldozed and it would have been developed throughout the 20th century. So their presence, even though they degraded the landscape significantly, actually prevented the complete loss of some of San Francisco's last remnant habitat. And so all of this degradation on the landscape was inherited by the Presidio Trust in the late 90s. And part of the federal mandate was to maintain and enhance not only the cultural resources, so the buildings and things like that, but also the natural resources. But the landscape was so far degraded, there, the staff, the original staff, natural resources staff at the time was way too small to deal with, with the majority of the restoration. So we relied heavily on our volunteers. This is a shot from the late 90s of the, some of the first volunteers uh, removing the ice plant that had taken over the dunes. A lot of the work I'm gonna talk, talk about today could not be done without volunteers. It just is not feasible. The amount of work, even such a small area as the Presidio, 1500 acres, could not be done without volunteer, the volunteer community. So this is just one example. As I said, I, I, I was the first dedicated staff to wildlife. The staff that came before me 
was focused primarily on vegetation. So we started to go through, this is before my time, but when I say we, the Natural Resources Department started to go through and look at different sites strategically and start to restore the geology and the water features and the vegetation and let kind of wildlife take it, take it on naturally. But this is an example of one of the first daylighting of a creek. So I'm gonna show you a time-lapse and we're gonna walk you through it. But this was a, a creek underneath this was filled over by the military. And this was created in a, turned into a shooting range, just a flat field. If you look out right now, all you see is a handful of different species. Most of them are non-native species. So very low diversity, very low habitat value. And this is an example of daylighting a creek. So, I'm gonna, so this is opening up the creek, finding the pipe, contouring out the creek, planting the native plants with volunteer help. And this is it developing through time. This is what we would call riparian habitat where water and land meet, fresh water and land meet. So you can see the drastic difference in, in structure. So it was a flat field to this highly structured, highly diverse plant life. And manifesting off of that is the wildlife. So we monitor a lot of different wildlife coming in from this and primarily the birds. The bird diversity from that flat field to this now complex riparian zone has gone up dramatically. The amount of resources for the birds has just increased with the amount of vegetation diversity that was restored. So that's one example of habitat restoration and building it. If you build it, they will come. So zooming into what my position is, I started, as Bill mentioned, I started as a volunteer around 2010 uh, doing habitat restoration. So weeding weeds and planting native plants. And through a series of internships and graduate school, I finished and was hired on as the first dedicated um, wildlife manager of the Presidio. So taking the Presidio's natural resources to the next level after so much rest habitat restoration, now starting to look at how do we restore and manage the wildlife diversity. And again, part of our federal mandate is to maintain, manage and enhance where possible the natural resources, including wildlife, of the Presidio. So that's my job is to really understand the trends of the wildlife, what was here, what is here, and what could be here. And what is here, how is it doing? Is it stable? Is it declining? Or is it increasing? If it's declining, why is it declining? And what can we do through management actions to reverse that decline and hopefully prevent another local extinction? So that's a big part of my job. Another part of my job is outreach and education because again, a lot of this urban nature is the focal point other than the nature itself is the people that live in the Presidio and people in the city and tourists that come through and experience the Presidio. So we wanna use these opportunities to, to educate the public, spread awareness about what's possible and why do we value urban nature. So I'm gonna go through some examples of what I've been talking about, ecosystem services and wildlife conservation in the Presidio of San Francisco. So this idea, as I mentioned, if you build it, they will come. That was the mantra. That is really the main mantra of um, ecological restoration. If you restore habitat, most wildlife will come in on their own. So things like birds can come in from long distances because they're very mobile with their, with their flight. Other, other critters don't have such an advantage, but generally, if you build it, they will come. This is one really cool example. The Western bluebird used to be very, very rare in San Francisco, very uncommon. You never really saw it because it just didn't have the suitable habitat to support its presence. Over the last couple of decades, this bird went from uncommon, rarely seen to very common. This, this bird is very common. You can see it almost anywhere in the Presidio, especially in our restoration sites. And you can not only see the adults, but every year you see fledglings, which means new generations every year. So this bird is increasing, especially over the last couple of decades because of habitat restoration. Another example of if you build it, they will come. This is the coastal green hair streak, another dune obligate butterfly. Butterflies lay their eggs on what are called host plants. A host plant is very specific to the species of butterfly, meaning that the butterfly evolved over millennia to with a special relationship to a specific plant that it depends on wholly. In this case, with the coastal green hair streak, it depends wholly on 
the coast buckwheat. It lays its egg on the coast buckwheat and its caterpillar hatches and can only eat that plant. It has a chemical dependency on that plant. If you lose host buckwheat, or if you lose the host plant of the butterfly, you lose the butterfly. And as I said earlier, primarily San Francisco is about 70% dunes. This butterfly would have covered most of San Francisco, but as it got paved over, so too did its host plant and the, the population just plummeted. Fortunately, some dunes were left in, San Fr in the Presidio and this tiny little butterfly, it's about the size of a dime, um, barely held on. So as we started to restore the dunes and spread the dunes back, including the host plant, coast buckwheat, so too did this butterfly start to spread throughout areas of restoration in the Presidio. And it's really been starting to really increase over the last five years. It's hopped over the golf course and golf course doesn't sound that big, but when you're the size of a little dime and any little gust of wind is going to be the biggest struggle in your life to fly against, hopping over a golf course and a highway is a big deal. And these little butterflies were able to hop over a highway and a golf course and end up in a new isolated dune patch where it took off over about a couple of years ago. So we're seeing the spread as we spread our restoration sites, the spread of creatures like this butterfly. This is another example, if you build it, they will come. Obviously that's the bridge in the background. For those of you who know that marsh right there, the big one in the middle is Chrissy Marsh. That was one of the first restoration sites in the Presidio in the early 2000s. That was once um, originally a marsh, then the military paved it over as an air landing field and a train depot yard in the early 2000s. They ripped all that up and created that marsh in the background. And the newest addition is what we call Quartermaster Reach, which is in the foreground here where that red crane is. That was only opened up a lot in the last couple of months. It's about seven acres of marsh habitat where um, it's a brackish habitat. So to the left is where the creek flows down. That creek that I showed earlier, the daylighting of that creek, that creek flows down into this area where bay water, salt water meets fresh water, which creates a mix in what we call brackish water. And as most of you probably know, this habitat type throughout San Francisco Bay is one of the rarest habitat types because it's flat and very easy to develop on. So this brackish marsh habitat in the Bay Area is very rare because it's all been developed over. So this creates an opportunity connecting to the Bay. And if you build it, they will come. And one target creature that we're focusing on right now is the Olympia oyster. So the Olympia oyster, as many of us know oysters, um, these are native to the West Coast. The ones that you get in the restaurant, the really big ones, are native primarily to either the East Coast or uh, Japan. But these little guys are actually struggling in the Bay because of lack of habitat and other situations like competition with invasive species and diseases that are being brought in and all the usual suspects to native wildlife decline. But their planktonic larvae are constantly floating around in the Bay water. And they're chemically sensing for other oysters, specifically the calcium carbonate that are in the shells. And as you see in the background, and we all know oyster reefs, basically where one oyster is, it attracts the planktonic larvae to settle on that oyster, creating a feedback loop, bigger and bigger, what we would call an oyster reef. So what we've been doing in that quartermaster reach site is actually building these structures with donated from local restaurants, crushed up oyster shells. Again, the calcium carbonate is chemically drawing in those planktonic larvae to settle on these reef balls and creating that feedback loop. So we've been installing these reef balls into Quartermaster Reach and the spawning season is just about to get underway. We only just recently installed 80 of these reef balls. So we're gonna to start to monitor and look for signs of oyster recruitment. And not only do these reef balls create habitat for oysters, but you can see that they're hollow inside, lots of nooks and crannies. So that's also prime habitat for fish nurseries, for example. So baby fish or fish will come in, lay their eggs inside those, and it gives a place for little baby fish that are vulnerable to predation, places to hide, places for other invertebrates like crabs and sea slugs and algae, seaweeds, all these things depend on complex structured habitat. So we're adding that into this, this new restoration site. If you build it, they will come. One of the important things, as I mentioned, is monitoring the wildlife in our, in our park. And one of the, we have a high diversity, even after the degradation that the military did on the landscape, but we still have high diversity and, and increasing as we continue to restore. But one of the biggest 
components of our diversity and the most unknown is our invertebrates. And as we all know, pollinators are one of the most important components of a healthy ecosystem. And bees in particular are really notorious for great pollination as you can see here. So we wanna know all of our diversity so we can better understand what is there and how they're doing and how we can better manage and conserve these different invertebrates. So we, bee identification is notoriously difficult, especially for these tiny, tiny little bees. So we always work with collaborators, California Academy of Sciences and local universities. Bill mentioned UC Davis, we work with them. We work with San Francisco State University, UC Berkeley, Stanford, you name it, we work with them because they have all their local expertise helping us specifically with the invertebrates, which is one of the most difficult um, group of organisms to really understand because there's so many of them and a lot of them are so tiny, but they're so important when you're talking about whole holistic ec um, ecosystem conservation because of the relationships. In many cases, some of these native bees are wholly dependent on one type or a couple types of native plants. And in turn, those native plants are wholly dependent upon those specific native bees. And if you lose one, you lose the other. So we wanna to try to maintain these relationships and strengthen these relationships. So we need to first know what is here and we need to know how they are doing trends through time. Are they decreasing? Are they stable? Are they increasing? And if so, how can we manage that towards our goal of stabilization or increasing. Another thing monitoring through time, we use a lot of high tech, high technology. Um, one of these is, this is an example of using um, a live stream camera to monitor some of our raptor nests. We installed this a couple of years ago on a red tail hawk nest and we streamed it live to the world. And it was a very popular, very successful um, opportunity. These two chicks were successfully fledged. And this is a really cool opportunity to show a number of things in this one shot alone. First, you can see, this is the mom right there. And you can see on her, on her ankle, her talon, that's a tag. We were actually able through the power of um, the, the audience, we were actually able to piece together all those numbers and codes on that. And we linked it to a database and we, we knew who this female was. She was born back in 20, 2006, north of the Golden Gate Bridge. She was tagged as a first year. She came into the Presidio and so she's still alive. So we're able to help long-term data, data gathering of raptor trends. So how long can these raptors actually live? And not only that, we were also able to watch how often her and her mate were, were bringing in food to feed these growing chicks. And you can see those are rodents. And what are rodents considered in urban areas? They are considered one of the number one pests. So this is a great educational opportunity to show people that our predators are actually providing an ecosystem service through their predation and consumption of our pest species, such as rats and gophers. So being able to, to, to really connect those dots to urban people is super important because for one reason, a lot of people, when they think rodents in their house, the first thing they wanna do is use poison. And what tends to happen is that poison then gets into the environment because rats that are exposed to poison are then consumed by baby hawks and other baby and other predators. And it gets into their body, their liver, and it accumulates and eventually they can die from that. We've actually found uh, predator um, raptors such as great horned owls and red tail hawks in the Presidio that have actually succumbed to rodenticide poisoning. We're not, we don't allow our residents to use rodenticide in the Presidio, but that doesn't mean that these raptors are getting exposed to rodents that are contaminated that are coming in from the city of San Francisco. So using these opportunities to show that direct link between um, rodents and predators, and if you are trying to poison them, you're also contaminating the environment, is a huge opportunity. So we, we really got a lot out of this camera and it was a great way to share to the world what's going on in the Presidio. So another big one that we are all sure familiar with, uh, you all live in the greater Bay Area, you all, I'm sure, have had some um, experiences with coyotes. And of course, they are no strangers in San Francisco, being one of the most urban areas in the Bay Area. And they are uh, they're all, all in San Francisco. They were actually missing from San Francisco. They went locally extinct in the, around the late 1920s. And it wasn't until the early 2000s that they actually came back into San Francisco. And since the early 2000s, have really established themselves in most all of the parks where they have everything that they need, food, water, and shelter. And so 
obviously there's a lot of um, conflict, whether real conflict or perceived conflict between coyotes and humans. And so part of our job here in the Presidio is, is managing and reducing that conflict, whether, again, whether that conflict is perceived conflict or real conflict. So a big part of that is managing humans. And really what I mean by that is education and outreach. So getting people to even understand what a coyote is, because a lot of urban people, they don't, they've never seen a coyote before. Um, they don't know what a coyote is, or if they do know what a coyote is, they've heard a lot of urban myths and legends around coyotes. Um, so a big part of my job is to, to educate the public on what a coyote is and what does it mean to live in the midst of a coyote, uh, of coyotes, and understanding how our behaviors if, as humans can actually drive or decrease potential conflict between these animals and us. And so one of the important things to understand is uh, the biggest source of conflict between coyotes and people is when people try to feed these coyotes. And I'm sure a lot of you heard about the recent uh, East Bay coyote that bit several people. Um, it was acting abnormally. We don't know for sure, but I would wager money that somebody or people, many people were actually feeding that coyote. And when you feed wildlife like coyotes, they start to associate people with food. And that means they're gonna to start to approach people expecting food. And that's when they're more likely to actually bite somebody. When a coyote starts to exhibit abnormal behavior like that, approaching people, it's been food condition. There's not much that you can do to reverse that behavior. In fact, it's nearly impossible, if not impossible. And the only thing that really can be done at that point is lethal removal. Because at that point, that becomes a, a public safety hazard. And that is, that is unacceptable behavior for urban coyote. And a lot of people I'm sure are thinking right now, well, why wouldn't you just relocate these coyotes, whether they're abnormal or just not at all, they just don't belong here, relocate them. That's the number one most frequently asked question that I get all the time. And right off the bat, everybody needs to understand that is illegal in the state of California. You cannot relocate a coyote in California. It is not legal. The state will never allow it. Not only is it illegal, but it doesn't work. You're moving either one problem animal into somebody else's area, they don't want that or you're moving a territorial animal into another animal's territory, causing all kinds of social problems within coyotes. And studies have shown that when you move a coyote, they're territorial, they wanna go straight back to where they came from. And usually what happens when they do that, they get hit by cars. So you're not solving any problems by doing that. And as you can see here in this picture, again, there's plenty of rodents. They love gophers and rats, and there are plenty of rodents in the city to sustain them. They don't need our help with food. One of the biggest sources of conflicts with coyotes in the Presidio is this time of year right now during the pupping season when coyotes have an active den site. That is when they're more likely to be aggressive towards dogs if the dog gets too close to the active den site. Coyotes see dogs and other canines that are not part of their family unit as a direct threat to their pups. And they will protect their den. And if a dog gets too close, they will aggressively chase them out of the area. And this is the time of the year that in the Presidio, we see a huge spike in conflict dogs and coyotes, because number one, the Presidio is one of the most popular dog walking sites in San Francisco. And number two, it's so small, there's only one, there's really only a handful of places where our breeding pair, we only have one breeding pair in the Presidio. There's only a handful of places where they can actually have their den. And usually it's right near an active dog walking trail. And what we found in our monitoring program is that when we identify the den site, the best course of action is to create a buffer around that den site so that dogs don't get too close to the den. When we create that buffer, as you can see in that map there, we close a section of trails just to dogs, not to people, just to dogs. And we reroute the dogs into areas away from the den. Conflict goes way down, way down. And in, in the outside of the pupping season, generally coyotes are indifferent to dogs, generally. Um, and as long as dogs aren't chasing coyotes, generally there's, there's very few conflicts between coyotes and dogs outside of the public season. Um, and just zooming out a little bit, the Presidio is not locals only. There are a lot of migratory species that come through the Presidio, such as this violet green swallow that comes all the way up from Latin America every year to breed here in the Presidio. And you can see in this map right here, the West Coast is um, part of the Pacific Flyway. So a lot of these migratory birds actually use 
the, the, the coastline on their, to, to navigate on their long distance migrations. And they're going really far. And what do they need? They need rest and fuel, food. So they have these stopover points and the Presidio is actually a stopover point for a lot of long distance migrants. And when they land here to rest and refuel, we want to be sure that we're providing the, the right habitat and, and food for them so that they can rest and recharge and continue on their long distance migrations. And in the cases where the migrants like the violet green swallow or the Allen's hummingbirds, they're coming up to nest here. They're not passing through, they're actually coming to nest in the Presidio. So we wanna be sure that we're providing all the rich habitat and resources that they need to continue these long distance migrations. And of course, not all migrants have backbones. We all know about the, the Western monarch and we've all probably heard about the significant decline that the Western monarch has had over the last several years. This year was the worst year on record. It's a very, very, very tedious position that the Western monarch is in right now. And because this is a migratory species, they come as far as the Rocky Mountains to overwinter on the coast of California. And what they like to do is they actually like to winter, overwinter in the eucalyptus forests. And one site, Rob Hill in the Presidio, is a overwintering area. And so these eucalyptus forests are non-native. They were planted by the military in the 1800s. But this opportunistic insect turns out really likes to overwinter on these trees. These trees are part of the historic features of the Presidio and federal mandate says that we have to maintain these parts of these historic eucalyptus forests indefinitely through time. So what we've started to do to try to help the monarch in the Presidio where we can work locally is actually try to enhance these overwintering forests. So we do selective tree thinning, which also promotes healthy eucalyptus trees. But we also started a novel approach to Make, make a hybrid ecosystem where we actually are going under these eucalyptus trees and planting shade tolerant native plants that flower during the time of the year that these overwintering monarchs are here. They need those flowering nectar resources to, to, to keep up their fat resources for their return migration to their breeding grounds. So we are trying to enhance their overwintering sites so that we can try to help and, and avert extinction of the Western monarch. But so far it's really a bigger problem than just the Presidio. So education outreach is huge. So one of the biggest, most exciting parts of my job is bringing back what once was lost. And what we call that is reintroduction. So just to define that, the in intentional movement of a species, sorry, my, my screen is blocked. So, but of, of an organism inside of its indigenous range in which it disappeared. So um, looking back in the museum records, we know a lot of the wildlife diversity that was once in the Presidio. And looking, doing um, surveys in modern times, we know what was lost. And doing a lot of habitat restoration and addressing the reasons why these species were lost, we can start to talk about potentially bringing back some of these species. So we've been really getting our feet wet over the last five to six years. This is one of the first examples. This is the variable checker spot butterfly. It was last seen in the 19, late 1970s in the Presidio. It was lost primarily due to loss of its host plant. And in, in this butterfly's case, its host plant, it has about two or three different host plants, but the primary host plant in this area is California bee plant, Scrofularia californica. And so as we've restored many acres of that bee plant and the habitat with all the nectar resources and flowers that the adults depend on, we started to say, well, why can't we just reintroduce this butterfly? And we know that this butterfly is too far away. It's the closest population is too far away. This butterfly, unlike the, the monarch, is a smaller, lazier flyer than the monarch. So it, it could never fly here on its own. So even though we built it, this lazy flying butterfly could never get here on its own. So we took it upon ourselves to go to the local population south of here in San Bruno Mountain, about seven or eight miles, collect a lot of, about a thousand caterpillars off of their host plant, bee plant, drive them back to the Presidio and put them right back onto the bee plant in the Presidio. We did that for two years, 2017, 2018, and stopped doing the translocations in 2018. And now, 2021, they are just thriving. These butterflies are all over. Right now is the flight season. So if you happen to be in the Presidio in the next couple of weeks, you cannot miss these butterflies. They are taking over the park in, in a good way. This is a, a one holistic project I wanted to quickly talk about. If you see in the lower right-hand corner, that lake right there, that's, um, that's Mountain Lake, that's Highway 1 right there. So if you've ever driven on Highway 1, 
north or south of the bridge, you've gone right next to Mount Lake and you probably didn't even notice it. It's a natural lake about 2000 years old and it has undergone a crazy transformation from the, over the last 2000 years from a pristine, beautiful lake that the indigenous Ohlone's would, would have been using for resources to a cesspool. Uh, the military again, just kind of degraded this lake to the point at which it became a toxic cesspool full of seasonal algae blooms that cause seasonal fish die-offs. Uh, mosquitoes, a lot of mosquito issues. It just smelled really bad. Um, toxic runoff from the highway, lead contamination and other heavy metal contamination into the sediments of the lake. Um, when the Presidio Trust inherited this lake, it was a mess, a toxic mess. So we decided to say, well, can, let's restore this lake. Let's, let's come up with a plan, a master plan. And this started in the year 2000, so a long time ago. But really the, the ultimate goals here are three, three, threefold and they're all interconnected. In, improve water quality, increase native biodiversity, and improve public awareness through education and outreach. So all of those are really tied into each other. And um, this is kind of an idealized picture that we created, a, a, a rendition of what we, we, we our, our objective and our goal, of ultimately what the lake would look like in terms of biodiversity. So a lot of these native plants and underwater plants and aquatic animals that were lost over the centuries, could we actually bring them back if we restore water quality and ecological health? So we started to address the reasons why the lake was in such bad health. You can see in the top left, that golf course was built in the late 1800s, uphill from the lake. What do they use to keep the greens green? Chemicals, what happens when it rains? Those chemicals and fertilizers end up in the lake and fuel algae blooms and other kinds of problems. So we work with the golf course to stop or reduce their use of chemicals creating different barriers to um, catch the stormwater runoff and hold it and let it percolate and clean before ultimately getting into the lake. Um, to the right, you can see the invasive species that the community, the, the Richmond neighborhood over the 80 years of the neighborhood developing started to release into the lake, whether for recreational fishery, fisheries or for uh, unwanted pets. All of these invasive species cause all kinds of problems with ecological health which resulted in the decline and local extinction of a lot of the native wildlife. And then on the bottom left, you see a barge there with the highway. I said there was a lot of highway runoff, lead contamination, et cetera. That barge was actually a, basically a big underwater vacuum cleaner that sucked up and cleaned a lot of the lead contamination out of the bottom sediments. So once we were able to do that around finishing up that, this component of the restoration in 2013, we started to look at and begin the, re, the reintroductions of wildlife. So this is the only native aquatic turtle on, in California, the Western pond turtle. With the collaboration of San Francisco Zoo, they had started um, basically uh, reared baby turtles in the zoo under ideal conditions to the point where they were no longer vulnerable to predation. And in 2015, we released 55 of these turtles into Mountain Lake. These are long lived turtles. They can live up upwards of 80 years. And you don't really know if you've succeeded in a reintroduction project until the organisms start to reproduce on their own and sustain through, through new generations. These turtles take a long time to get to sexual maturity. So we weren't sure when or even if they were gonna be able to have a successful nest in around this area where there's very limited nesting habitat. And even if they do nest, there's a lot of predators and, and other dangers like cars and lawnmowers and golfers, things like that. So it was kind of a long shot. We really didn't know what we were doing. This was never been done before in an urban area, but I've got some really great news. Very appropriate for Earth Day today. This Monday, we were out at the lake doing something unrelated and we happened to find the very first confirmed baby Western pond turtle born and bred in San Francisco in probably over 80 years, maybe even more than that. So this little, this little creature is only the size of a quarter and so this is a big deal in terms of Western pond turtle conservation and specifically the mountain lake reintroduction because uh, reproduction is, is really important. So great news for Earth Day. We started to reintroduce the native chorus frog, Pacific chorus frog. So we, we, we translocated egg masses into the lake and watched them develop and, and supplemental, feed, fed them supplemental algae pellets to get them big and fat. And when they turned into froglets, we released them into the lake. We did about 
a thousand froglets over the course of two years. And now these frogs that were almost once lost to San Francisco are thriving in Mountain Lake. And if you go there in the late winter, early spring, during the breeding season, you'll know why they call them chorus frogs. I'm sure a lot of you have heard the chorusing um, in your neighborhoods, hopefully, or at least in your rural areas around your, your neighborhoods. The only native fish that we knew of in, in the, um, Mountain Lake was the three-spined stickleback. So we, we, we translocated about a thousand of these and um, when they, they started to breed immediately. So that was a very successful um, reintroduction. But these are really important in terms of what I talked about earlier, ecosystem services, because they like to eat mosquitoes. And if we're talking about restoring or even creating aquatic water bodies in urban areas, one of the number one red flag knee-jerk reactions of the public is, oh, great, now we're gonna have mosquito problems. We don't want mosquito problems. Nobody wants mosquito problems. As I said earlier, the lake in the late 90s when the Presidio took over, we took over the mountain lake, we had mosquito problems. We wanted to solve that problem. So bringing more checks and balances like predation on these mosquitoes, um, checks and balances are really important so that you can reduce um, mosquito problems. So stickleback helped with that. But they're also really important with another wildlife reintroduction because, well, let me get to that. This is a Anodonte californiensis freshwater mussel. Freshwater mussels are becoming one of the rarest, most imperiled groups of organisms in North America because water quality in general is just declining. And these filter feeders are really sensitive to water contamination, but they're really important for water quality. Um, they're they're long-lived. They can live 15 plus years. They get big. They're not like marine mussels that you all know. These actually live in the sediment and they can move around. And um, they're very rare in California and becoming more and more rare. And they have a really complicated life, life cycle that actually depends on the stickleback. Their larvae, the glochidia is what they're called, as you see there on the left, depend on a host fish. The female broods her, her brood and her gills, the glochidia. When a fish comes by, she spits them out. They clamp down onto the gills and the fins of the fish without hurting the fish. And they absorb nutrients for a couple of weeks before dropping off into the sediment, starting all over again. So if you don't have a host fish like the stickleback, you cannot successfully reintroduce this mussel. If you lose the host fish, you're gonna lose the mussel. Another reason why these mussels are declining throughout California and the United States. So as we restored the stickleback, we were able to restore the freshwater mussel. Another example of an ecosystem service, they're filter feeders. They're constantly cleaning the water, pulling out little particulates as food. On the left, you see the absence of mussels. And on the right, you see their impact of their filtration. So again, another example of ecosystem services, and that was, again, one of our goals to restoring Mountain Lake was increase water quality. The other really cool thing, one of our partners at Stanford actually was able to, to confirm that these, these mussels actually remove E. coli from the water. And most urban water bodies have E. coli issues. Usually it's because underground sewage, uh, sewer lines are so old, they have leaks, and that can come through the groundwater. And there is E. coli in Mountain Lake, and there's a playground near Mountain Lake, and kids play in the water. We don't want it, we don't want E. coli. We want to clean that up. So these mussels, we have tens of thousands of these mussels now in the lake, constantly filtering the water. They're basically little biological filters. They are the underdogs of the water quality, and they're really unknown to the general public. So these are really exciting animals, really cool animals, really important animals. Another really cool animal is the uh, this is a damselfly basically a small dragonfly. This is one of the rarest damselflies in North America. It's called the San Francisco fork-tailed damselfly. Um, they, only, they only exist in a handful of places these days, so they are very close to extinction. So another partnership with San Francisco Zoo, they actually catch the few that remain and they breed them in their facilities. And, and it actually have results ha, has resulted over the last couple of years of tens of thousands of their they're called naiads. They're baby, baby damselflies. You can see the tails hanging off their abdomens. Those are actually their gills. These are fully dependent on water as young. They, they, have, they live underwater and they're voracious predators, but they need clean, healthy wetlands and lakes like Mountain Lake to survive. And most wetlands in San Francisco and the Bay Area have been plowed over or contaminated or infested with invasive species. So these species, this species is incredibly rare, almost extinct. And we've been bringing it back slowly, starting to gain traction. Another great example of an ecosystem service, these, 
voracious predators love to eat mosquitoes. So again, bringing back these checks and balances, predation pressure on our pests like mosquitoes are really gonna help us reduce mosquito outbreaks. And of course, just starting to wrap this talk up, the human dimension, right? We're talking about urban nature, which has always been kind of scoffed or ignored by conservationists and scientists thinking urban areas are, are wastelands not worth your time. But as I said earlier, more and more people are becoming urban people and there's a bigger and bigger disconnect between humans and nature, especially kids. And how can you talk about conserving a rainforest down in Amazon, the Amazon or some far off place? If you don't know about it, you don't care about it. So really trying to target urban, the urban audience, specifically the kids around a lot of these projects and using um, these charismatic animals to really get our messages across. And this is one of our social marketing campaigns that we've done in Mountain Lake, really trying to address a lot of the reasons why Mountain Lake and a lot of other areas that have problems. Feeding animals, like I said, with coyotes causes all kinds of problems. Picking up after your pets, a big source of E. coli into the lake is dog poop, unfortunately. Abandoning pets, causing invasive species spread and disease spread and things like that. And again, spreading the knowledge. So learning about things and talking about things with your community and spreading the information and using these ambassador species. Everybody loves a turtle, but people might not like a freshwater mussel so much. But when you start to talk about the connections between turtles and mussels and all these other really intricate connections and how important they are for everything, including us as the urban audience, people really start to understand and start to value it and start to appreciate it and want to protect it. So this is a perfect opportunity to bring all of these stories, all of this diverse audience, whether they live in San Francisco or whether they're coming through as tourists, we get a lot of foot traffic. And looking at what the diversity that once it occurred in the Presidio and understanding where we are going in terms of habitat restoration and potential for wildlife reintroductions. Wildlife reintroductions are a fairly recent tool for conservation sciences, so there's still a lot to learn. There's a lot of techniques that really need to get hashed out. And the more and more we go into the 21st century, the more and more we're gonna to need to start using these techniques. So using the Presidio as an opportunity to experiment on what does it actually take to reintroduce successfully these different types of species. Each species has its own biology, has its own place in the ecosystem, has its own needs and resource needs and everything. So here's a, a, just a, a snapshot of some of the potential species that once occurred in San Francisco or once occurred in the Presidio that we are starting to seriously consider, can we actually bring back these different organisms into the Presidio? And again, using all of these as stories to engage the public and also provide benefits to us through ecosystem services. So just to recap, why does it matter? Ecosystem resilience, I didn't really touch on that too much, but the more complex an ecosystem is, the more resilient it is. And when we start to talk about climate change and really the unknowns of how that's really gonna pan out, the best course of action that we can do right now to try to protect our ecosystems is to promote complexity. Complexity is gonna be more resilient in the face of change. Ecosystem services, I hope I gave some pretty clear examples of that, but these plants and animals should exist in their, for their own right, but they also benefit us through the services that they provide like predation on rodents and mosquitoes, uh, clean water through their filtration, things like that. Sense of place, the biodiversity that occurs in San Francisco, the combination of species, occurs nowhere else in the world. San Francisco Bay Area is a globally recognized biodiversity hotspot. And so having this, this sense of place, knowing your local plants and animals, the local flavor, it, it's, it's, it's pride in the place that you live, but it also is just, it's, it's nice to be able to go somewhere else and see that local assemblage of plants and animals. So to we don't want a monoculture across the world because that would be boring. We wanna have local flavors and the Bay Area, San Francisco is globally recognized. And then of course, mental and physical health. We talked about that during the pandemic, being shut up and in, indoors for so long. I think we can all really understand and appreciate the value of having access to natural areas. And if you're fortunate enough, you can drive far or fly far and visit some of these really remote areas, but most urban people, they don't have that luxury. And some people just get off work and they just wanna go for a stroll down a trail. They don't wanna go on a long road trip. They just wanna go stroll and just relax. 
So really, I think people really understand after COVID the value of having urban nature and access to that urban nature. And again, just to, just to finish this off, as we continue into the 21st century and urban areas are expanded upon or retrofitted or even created, we want to think, how do we want our urban areas to look? Do we want them to continue this concrete jungle, this traditional look, or do we want to be more thoughtful with integrating nature into our urban areas? So the Presidio is really on the cutting edge of what is possible in the future of cities. So I'm going to end on that note, and thank you. I hope I didn't go too long. Wow, that was great, Jonathan. Thank you very much. And that was really, really interesting. I, I especially love the story of the mountain lake. And I'll start with a question. Um, I'm curious about mountain lake. So, so it sounds like you've been really successful in restoring it. But in an urban environment like that, it's going to be a, a continuous yep. long term project to keep that in a good condition because I mean, I mean, you know that obviously. Uh, that's why that's why community involvement and education is essential and management is never we're never going to be at a time where we can just walk away and that really you know in this day and age there's really nowhere in the world that is pristine it's the human impact is just everywhere and honestly ma management for conservation is at some level is always going to be necessary and in urban areas especially obviously but even in in Yosemite. I mean, obviously Yosemite gets a lot of foot traffic, but some people think of Yosemite as like a wild space that's natural, but they're managing that constantly. Management is, is it's never going to end. The, the project I was mentioning that we're working on is an old landfill and we've got a, a wetland there, which is going to be a permanent wetland. And we're close enough to a natural population of Western pond turtles. We, we think they're going to, they're going to populate it naturally. Um, but we're really concerned people are going to drop in red-eared sliders and bullfrogs and goldfish and all that stuff. And we don't have near the kind of population you do. I caught four red-eared sliders this week. Wow. Those were only recently put into that lake. Wow. Oh, and also the mussels. You said that I'd never heard of that mussel before. All I hear yep. about for freshwater mussels is the invasive mussels. No, yeah, that's, that's, if, 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 if most people don't know about freshwater mussels, and if they do, they think exactly like, oh, they're all invasive. But it, it's, it's really unfortunate because they're really cool, interesting organisms with the whole parasitic life cycle, and they're becoming more and more rare, and it's really tragic because they're so important to water quality, uh, but people just don't know about them, and they're just, they're just going to disappear under our noses. So I wonder if we have an opportunity to introduce those in our little- You little send list. me an email because we actually are starting a network of, and we have this big project that it, I think you would, if you have the habitat, we have the material. Great. Okay, so there's a, a question from Adam. He's saying, could you briefly describe how geologically dune habitat forms and how it is restored? So, Dune habitat, you got to think really big, right? So a lot of that sand that's coming now is getting with the high, the tides coming in and out of San Francisco Bay, they're pushing out a lot of sedimentation. Some of that sedimentation is coming from all the way up in the Sierra Nevadas through erosion, and it makes its way down through the delta, through the bay, out, out the Golden Gate. Currents take it, currents push it against Ocean Beach, which is the main western edge of San Francisco. Currents and wind push that stuff up. If anybody's familiar with San Francisco and has driven on the Great Highway, which is the last road that runs parallel or used to run parallel, um, there it's constantly being covered with dunes, shifting sand, and they're constantly have to bulldozing it to clear it off. So it's constantly sand coming up from the ocean and would have been blowing over all of San Francisco. We didn't, that doesn't happen anymore to that extent. So what we do when we restore dunes, we actually get dune sand from local projects. So if anybody's ever been to California Academy of Sciences in the last eight years, you'll know, or the De Young Museum, you'll know that there's an underground parking lot. When they dug that out, they actually exposed historic dune sand and they had to get rid of it. And they heard, hey, the Presidio is restoring dunes. We have a lot of dune sand, do you want it? It's like, absolutely. So we'll go in, we'll take it, we'll identify a site, we'll clear it out, 
whatever needs to be cleared out, whether if it's military contamination or invasive plants or all of the above, and then we'll, we'll bring in the sand. And then we have our own native plant nursery and we grow our local native plants from local genetics. And then we plant those plants over the course of several years with volunteer help. And we, we manage and maintain that, that site until it becomes self-sufficient. And then in that case, we, have, we can scale back our management and our efforts on it because it's, it's established enough to where it's pretty self-sufficient. We do have to go in and do cleanup work with invasive ivies that will creep and crawl through time. But generally that's kind of how dune restoration is done. Okay, I have a question about um, the, the California quail. So in, the, in our local mountains, we have an abundance of California quail. They're everywhere. So are you, is there any ideas of reintroducing them? Yeah, and now that I know that you have a lot of them, I might come ask you for some. Um, <laughs> we, we're working with a local scientist, a group of scientists, San Francisco, San Francisco Estuary Institute, a brilliant group of people. And what we've been doing is exploring the feasibility of that project. It's a really complicated project. And so we want to start with a solid foundation of scientific um, evidence to back it up. So what they've been doing is actually using eBird. If anybody's from a birder, you know eBird. It's, it's basically a community science app to upload your, your birding observations. They've taken quail observations from across the state of California in urban areas, and they've developed mathematical models to compare to the parameters, the habitat parameters of the Presidio. So why do the quail survive in urban parks, say down in Southern California? What parameters of those parks are mathematically significant in supporting quail? And then what in the Presidio is close or can be modified to improve and increase those likelihoods? So we're really exploring the very initial phases of that, but we wanna really be 100% certain because it's a very complex project and we want to know really how can we approach this and how can we justify this? We need science to back this up. So we got a long way to go, but it's, it's, it's it, the results so far from, from, from their, their research is suggesting that it can be done. Okay, here's a question from Ralph <clears throat> saying, once while eating, eating breakfast at a hotel in the Presidio, a coyote loped by the window festooned with many collars, bandanas, and ornaments. What's up with that? So that was a slight exaggeration, but we part of our, <laughs> our, our monitoring program for coyote management is trying to understand these animals in our area. And they are notoriously difficult to study because they are so smart and so elusive and they are so mobile, they can cover the whole city in one night. So you really don't know what they're doing unless you start to use modern technology like GPS tracking collars to monitor their movements. So we've started this really high resolution monitoring program and it's, it's been getting um, bigger and bigger in terms of the depth that we're digging into because we're, we're getting collaborations with folks from UC Davis and UC Berkeley and National Park Service. But really we wanna know who are our coyotes. So we tag them so we know who the individuals are, who's the alpha female, who's the alpha male, where are the pups? Where do the pups go? How are the pups dying? Are these animals healthy? So we take a variety of health screens, blood draws, swabs. What kind of diseases have they been exposed to? What are they eating? Are they eating human food? Or are they eating natural food or some combination thereof? And um, how are they using the city? Are there any areas in particular that are causing their habitat use and human recreation use that are causing conflict? So that all this information is getting plugged back into our education and outreach, as well as our long-term monitoring and management. Because before we started doing this, we didn't even know how many coyotes were in the Presidio. We didn't know anything about them. And we had conflict to manage. Again, perceived or real conflict, doesn't matter. We, have, we wanna manage this, we wanna reduce this, we wanna promote coexistence. And to do that, we needed to have a more informed approach. So we've done this, we started this monitoring program with a lot of collaborators. And it's, really it's still in its in its early phases because there's a long way to go there's a lot to learn these coyotes aren't going anywhere and we've been making a lot of progress in terms of public attitudes and conflict reduction it's been the needle has been moving uh, on the subject of coyotes still you um i was wondering if you could say a little bit about coyote society because you mentioned well i don't i don't know how many coyotes are there but you said that there's only one breeding pair 
in the Presidio. In the Presidio, okay. Yeah, there, there, there's other breeding pairs throughout San Francisco, but the Presidio, we never knew this until we started our tracking program. Um, but we know now that there's always one breeding pair and they have a litter every year. And that litter, most of those pups don't make it past their first year. And it's a complicated story, but they're social animals and they usually don't tolerate their offspring after about a year. So they usually kick their offspring out at about a year of age. And those pups go on what we call dispersal. So they go on, they try to find their own territory. And we wanted to know where are they going and what are their ultimate fates? So we've been able to track some of these pups and really un uncover some of their dramas that we would otherwise never know. One example that's really pretty extraordinary is one of the pups left San Francisco, the Presidio, and in less than two months, he traveled all the way down the peninsula, staying in the suburbs, not going into the Santa Cruz mountains, all the way down well past San Jose. So 70 plus miles. And then he turned back around and went up closer to Los Gatos area. And then he started to live right on the intersection on Highway 280 and Highway 85. And what happens when coyotes live right on the highway intersection? They get hit by cars. So we've really seen what happens to most of these pups. They don't survive the harsh realities of urban traffic. But we want to know that because they're breeding. And a lot of people think, oh, my God, they're breeding. They're going to overpopulate the city. We're going to be overrun with coyotes. But when you actually start to understand it, they are breeding, but very few of those pups are actually surviving past their second year. And we've had, we've been able to track several pups over the last several years that have actually made it past their second year. And once they make it that far, they're really smart, they're really keen, and they understand how to navigate the dangers of urban traffic. So we have had some success stories where they've gone out, out of the city into these more suburban rural areas, and they've, they've found a territory and they found a mate. So it's, it's really interesting to uncover these dramas that we wouldn't know otherwise. And it really helps us, again, inform our management and increase and improve our public outreach because people will have questions and before we weren't able to answer them, but now we're actually able to answer these questions. Okay, here's another question. Besides coyote, what are the other urban carnivores found in the Presidio? Well, we have the miso carnivores, so the raccoons and the skunks and things like that. But um, it seems like now over the last seven years, more and more common are we seeing mountain lions come into San Francisco. It never used to really happen. And then it started happening once every couple of years. And now it's once every year, if not two or three times every year. And that's always pretty exciting. They never stick around. It's usually a juvenile that's dispersing, trying to find its own territory and just takes the coastline up the peninsula and then turns back around and leaves. But every now and then they get stuck somewhere where they shouldn't be. And it's drama, of course. Um, so we've developed, we work regularly with San Francisco Rec and Park and Animal Care and Control on coyotes and mountain lions and raccoons. So we have a team and every time we get evidence, camera or um, credible reports of these animals, we respond as rapidly as we can. We call the state in. State California Fish and Wildlife Service, they are the only ones that are allowed to use tranquilizers on mountain lions. Um, occasionally we get bob, bobcats, but that's very, very rare. Gray fox do come through. They don't last very long. They tend to get hit by cars, unfortunately. And, and the non-native red fox tends to come through occasionally, but again, they tend to get hit by cars. <coughs> okay. Um... There are no other questions in the chat. Anybody have any more questions? I see uh, um, Anne has a question raising her hand. Oh, I missed that. Oh. Anne, you have a question. Feel free, Anne, if you uh, still have a question. No, I don't have a question, um, but I wanted to tell you how much we've enjoyed your presentation and thank you. Thank you. you. All right, thanks, Anne. Okay, uh, there's just a few more thank yous. I'm sure as soon as, as, soon as we leave, I'm gonna have questions. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot to talk about and, and you know, trying to give a big picture. I, there's so many details I'm not able to go into obviously, but um, just to at least give a, a good, big, broad brushstroke of what's going on in the Presidio right now. 
Um, and a lot of, I'll just say a lot of municipalities around the Bay Area and even beyond. I got an email from someone in Texas last week. They're reaching out to us for, for help, whether it be coyote management or urban wildlife restoration and monitoring or education approaches. So there's, it's really a new field, urban conservation and urban ecology is, it's really a 21st century thing that we don't have a lot of knowledge in. And it's a really cool pioneer because again, traditionally ecologists looked outwards. They didn't even consider potential in urban areas. But now more and more people are really starting to understand, hey, wait a minute, there's something to this. And we have a huge gap in our knowledge. So it's really cool. And, and I'm one person, I got a lot on my plate. My favorite part of my job is being able to collaborate with scientists. It's so fun because they are the brains and I get, to, I get to be part of their work and they help me with my management, my goals, conservation. And we help them by pushing the science forward. So it's really great. That's one of my favorite parts. Yeah, that, that is really fascinating. Uh, and there were a couple more, <laughs> more last minute questions here. So um, one question about feral cats, domestic cats, where do they fit into the picture? That's a great question because that is a very urban reality. So the Presidio used to have a feral cat problem. Problem Depends on how you define it. As an mm -hmm. ecologist, it's kind of a problem because um, they, of course, prey on native birds and lizards and things like that. Um, we There used to be a big feral cat colony and we were trying to trap and relocate them, but that was not doing so well. Um, and it's probably one of the main drivers of why the California quail went locally extinct. Um, but as I said, in the early 2000s, coyotes came back and there are no, there's no longer that cat colony in the Presidio. So I think that's a combination of things, our, our relocation efforts um, and hopefully public awareness, stop, stop releasing cats. <laughs> but um, coyotes, I think had a big role in that potentially. But again, now that we're talking about restoring California quail, well, why did they go extinct in the first place? A lot of reasons, but cats were certainly one of them. Do you have the cat problem anymore? No, okay, well, that's a positive towards the project of restoring quail. Okay, I, I just wanted to share you a story I have from when I lived in San Francisco. I lived in a, a little apartment with a tiny, tiny backyard and I tried to do a little bit of gardening and I, there was just a little space, it's real sandy soil and I thought I'd plant something and I was really surprised when I dug up a little newt. So there's uh, a was it, a, it was probably a slender salamander, the ones that are almost like look like worms. I, I think that's what it was. Yeah. yeah. So I was really surprised that those are surviving in the middle of San Francisco. It's One like, of the most common vertebrates in, in California. Because they are everywhere, even in the most urban backyard in San Francisco. Oh, that's great. I had a question. Yeah. Um, so I actually am a preschool teacher and we're having our whole class outside in Presidio every day. Mm -hmm. Friday and we've had this ongoing mystery that we've been trying to solve and um, basically in September there was 11 dead fish in the parking lot and we were wondering like why were there so many dead fish in the parking lot and I was wondering if you had any insights oh yeah the mystery of the random fish it's come up it happens I was in this national cemetery doing some coyote work and all of a sudden a bunch of little uh, sardines fell from the sky and landed on me. Um, pelicans. Oh, wow. Yep. Okay. That is incredible. Yeah. So it's not the good of our imagination. This is a thing that happens. Yep. It's not often, but it's, they, they, they get their mouths full and they fly and they drop some. Wow. So you think, so is that like a whole flock of them or is it? Like uh, I don't, I don't know. I think it could just be an individual or maybe, maybe I'm not too sure exactly, but we, we were definitely able to confirm it one day. Hey, there it is. That's what, that's the cause of it. <laughs> yeah, that is so cool. I'll, I'll be really excited to get their thoughts about this. The kids will love that answer too. Yeah. yeah and if you go to Chrissy Field in the marsh, you can usually see the pelicans hanging out there too. 
Cool. Wow. Yeah. I, I don't live that far from Chrissy Field. So yeah, it'll be a fun adventure to check them out. Thank you so much. Yeah, definitely. See you in the park. Yeah. <laughs> And would it be okay if people contact you? Yeah, sure. Um, I would say uh, you can email me if you have any questions or anything. Jay Young, J Y O U N G at Presidio Trust.gov. And there's plenty more information on the Presidio's website, presidio.gov. And um, yeah. Okay, I'm typing it in the, the chat. So Jay Young at Presidio dot... Presidio Trust. Presidio Trust. Dot G-O-V. Okay, great. Thank you, Jonathan. All right, any more questions? I think we're gonna let you go. So thank you very, very much, Jonathan. It was a really good talk. Really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, bye everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs>